It's a real pleasure to be here this evening and uh, to share with you uh, some ideas about the future of music. It's a big topic, so I thought I would call this a future of music because uh, with the short amount of time we have, I, I can't tell you all the different things that I do, nor can I cover, um, you know, we have such expertise here from other parts of the music world. But I did want to give you um, an idea of certain things that I think are important that are changing in the music world uh, that are potentially extremely exciting, and maybe some ways of thinking about them that could make the future of music uh, quite bright indeed. One of the wonderful things these days is that I think music is in the public consciousness more than it's been in a long time. And uh, I come from MIT in the university world. Uh, in the last five or 10 years, I don't know if you're aware, but music has become one of the most um, attractive subjects for, for people to study. Uh, people are finally asking, you know, why do so many people around the world spend really large numbers of hours every day, every year, listening to music? They're, we don't really know why. Why does every society have music? What goes on in our brains when we listen to music? Why does it affect our emotions? These are major studies going on right now. And um, sometimes the studies lead us to be a little overly optimistic. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the Mozart effect. If anybody hasn't heard of this, you're all, no, this is a London, all you all know the Mozart effect. So the Mozart effect was kind of a little overreaching. A few years ago, um, research came out saying that music had such a powerful effect on human beings that just playing it in the background, in fact, playing it, you've probably seen all the, the, the merchandise out there, playing music when your baby's in vitro, uh, you know, playing Mozart would have a measurable effect on 10 IQ points for your baby. So just playing music would, would change your mental abilities. It's a great idea, but of course, it doesn't, doesn't work. It'd be really nice. If it worked, we could play music right now and we'd all be um, better off for it. But it turns out music does have extremely powerful effects, but only if you're engaged actively in music. So in general, the, kind of, the field that I feel like I've been involved in uh, and I think which is central to where music's going is what, I, what we call active music. How do we get as many people as possible not just listening passively to music, but engaged in music somehow, whether it's uh, modifying it, shaping it, creating it, performing it, or listening with your full being. How do you do that? And uh, in many ways, there's been an enormous breakthrough in the last few years. Uh, so kind of the good news of this story is that if I gave this talk a few years ago, I would have said there's a big paradox between everybody has an iPod, everybody's listening to music, there's music around all the time, but fewer and fewer people are actually touching music or, invol or are involved in making it, and that's not a good thing. But as Ralph referred to um, in the introduction, the incredible um, change in this whole field in the last few years um, has been this. So um, Guitar Hero and Rock Band really did change things. They, 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 they became successful when nobody thought they were. Um, I mean, I'm kind of happy about this because in fact the people who invented it are, are my students and the work came out of our lab. These, these guys struggled for 13 years trying to figure out a way to make music that the public could touch and manipulate uh, and, and participate in, and the, finally the Guitar Hero model is what caught on. And the good news about this is that it certainly proves the fact that large numbers of people are interested in doing more than sitting back and listening to music in the background, uh, somehow being part of a music experience, touching music, engaging in music, playing back and forth, participating with others. So that's the good news about it. The bad news, as any of you who've tried Guitar Hero know, is that it's really not very musical. I mean, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's okay as a video game. It goes a certain distance. It's been an enormous commercial success, but if it, you know, it, it's not only not the end of the story, but it, it, but it could be very destructive because it makes you feel like you're doing something musically that you're not really doing. So in some ways, in this little bit of time that we have together this evening, I wanted to talk a little bit about what might come after Guitar Hero. Um, what does it take to produce experiences that have that kind of stickiness and, and addiction, you know, the, the good part of addiction that people have when they play Guitar Hero, but is also a deep, rich, rewarding, sustaining experience? Um, if you have the general public participating in, in recreating and in, in performing a piece of music, or as, as Radiohead does, send out a piece on the internet and allow the public to remix it, what's a way of thinking about a completely different relationship between 
uh, the person who creates the music, who performs it, the audience who listens, perhaps the, the people who market the music, that's all completely changed. And I don't think we've, we've figured out how to think about uh, this new constellation, so something that I hope we can discuss this evening, and how all this can add up to let music uh, reach its full power. Um, we know music's enjoyable, uh, entertaining, but it's also much more than that. It's transformative, uh, and that's where we want to see music go. So um, let me show you some ideas about where I think some of this is going. Um, Ralph mentioned our work in hyper instruments. I think one thing that you see in Guitar Hero is that um, nothing that you do on that guitar really changes the music. It doesn't really know how you're playing. You're just pushing buttons and st strumming a little rubber thing down here. Um, what you really want are instruments that know everything about how they're being played. And you want these instruments to be responsive to great musicians like Yo-Yo Ma, but also to anybody, because everybody can be expressive musically even if you haven't practiced for 20 years. So we've been working on these instruments for a while. Uh, the classic Yo-Yo Ma instrument, uh, we built a special cello. It measures where his fingers are. It measures the sound coming out. And it measures with great detail. I can tell you later more if you want. It's kind of interesting. Um, it measures bowing, because bowing for a string player is like breathing for a singer. It measures everything about horsehair on string and pressure and angle. And uh, so Yo-Yo can play this. Here's just a little clip of Yo-Yo uh, playing this hyper cello. Um, depending on how he interprets the music, the cello completely changes. It can go in playing a melody and come out playing a full orchestra. It can go in sounding like a cello, come out sounding like a flute, all depending on his interpretation. But I thought I'd show you a couple of things which are brand new. These are literally um, done by some of our students in the last couple of weeks. Um, this is one of our students who took an electric guitar, uh, took a Wii controller, which all of you know. It's the Nintendo controller. Um, put the, the Wii on his guitar and then programmed it so that um, Everything about the guitar playing can be changed by moving the guitar physically. So you can change effects, you can change the sound of the guitar. Um, and it's very simple, but it's pretty cool. Um, this, this project was shown for the first time yesterday at MIT. Nobody had ever seen this. I don't think anybody outside of MIT has seen this. I think this is so, this is completely different. But just to show you that instruments themselves and the way to play them are really changing. Um, this is a guy named Amit Zoran, one of our students. And his idea was to design a guitar that had the best features of a traditional guitar, an electric guitar, and something which could morph and change in, in a variety of ways. Um, he'll explain it himself in a second. But as you can see from this design, uh, what he's done is he's taken a frame which looks like an electric guitar. And within that frame, there, you can make an, many, many resonators. So if you think of it, uh, in, the resonators are all made out of wood. They're all designed with a luthier, so they're very finely made. Each one has different properties. They're made of different kinds of wood, different thickness, different um, reinforcements on the back. And each of those has uh, sensors in them. And basically what you do is you, you flip out the inside, um, the little belly, put in a new resonator, and with the same physical instrument, you have a guitar which sounds completely different, and it marries the physical properties of that piece of wood with whatever electronic processing you have. He showed this, he demoed this at MIT yesterday with about 20 of these different resonators. And each one he put in made it sound like a completely different make of guitar and sound of guitar, and all extremely realistic. So this is the beginning of this work, but I think it's an indication of where instruments might go, a hybrid between physical, he calls this physical DNA put in a, in a virtual environment. Um, so we make many of these kinds of instruments for all kinds of different users. Uh, we're also very interested, this is where the Guitar Hero work came from. Um, we're also very interested in making instruments that can be played by people who love music but are not trained professionals, certainly are not uh, Yo-Yo Ma level. Um, and one of the larger projects we built was called the Brain Opera. We made a whole orchestra of instruments which anybody could play using natural skill. So um, harmonic driving was kind of the precursor to Guitar Hero. It's a driving game where you drive musical notes down a road. Depending on how you drive, uh, the composition changes. The great thing about uh, making systems like this is you can program them so that the response, the, the reaction, the relationship between how I drive and how I change this interface and the music that comes out can be anything that you want. So for instance, in this game, I programmed uh, the relationship. If you, if you drive this instrument like I drive, which is a kind of neurotic Boston driver, always late, you know, quite kind of angry on the road, um, the more you drive like that, the better the music sounds. So it gets, uh, you know, it, it, it has more timbral interest and more counterpoint. And, and if you drive safe right down the middle of the road, it sounds really lousy, you know, so, so 
That's my prerogative. They're all um, gesture wall, which measures the electricity in your body and allows you to shape big orchestral sounds just by moving. A melody easel that does, allows you to compose and modify melodies by moving your finger on a touch and pressure sensitive surface. Uh, a whole variety of the human voices. You know, it's, it's, it, it, we're all very natural with our voices, but if you can figure out a way to use your voice as an entry into a rich musical world, we, you can do that through speaking, through singing. Actually, we tuned the singing tree completely opposite to the harmonic driving. Um, we don't give anybody instructions. You go and explore these instruments. If you sing, the, the more purely you sing, if you sing a, a kind of single note meditation like, oh, um, the system recognizes that and all of the counterpoint and instrumentation and sounds align and the system gets incredibly beautiful if you sing a very simple note. And the, the further you diverge from that, the more it gets, it kind of amplifies the, um, the tension in your voice. So um, this, we designed this as a performance system and then had the opportunity to build a museum. If you ever go to Vienna, there's a, a place called the House of Music, which is the only, I think the only hands-on museum for classical music in the world. We built this with the Vienna Philharmonic um, and you can look at the history of music, acoustics, and then create your own music with the Brain Opera. So I we designed the Brain Opera for kind of people like you, um, normal concert goers, uh, to try to change people's attitudes about sitting passively in a concert versus diving in and participating. Um, and everywhere we brought it in the world, uh, we toured pretty much everywhere, we found that the people who enjoyed it the most and who understood it immediately and came back over and over again were always the youngest people, so um, eight and under, and the oldest people, 70 and under. And actually, both of them kind of surprised me. I had, our kids were really, really little at that point, and we thought this would be kind of loud and scary, and, but they got it right away, and not just not our kids, but kids. And then grandparents would come. And um, something about the invitation to be in a public setting, a non threat it's not like karaoke where you're up performing for other people. You're in a group. You can participate or not participate, look over someone's shoulder, and make a collaborative composition together uh, really seemed to attract uh, interest. So I, I decided to concentrate on thinking about musical experiences for youngest people and oldest people, which is something I've been working on for the last few years. So um, we've, we have an ongoing project to try to introduce children to music in a much more exciting, immersive, uh, joyous way than is traditionally done. And uh, the, the overall project is called Toy Symphony. It involves building a series of instruments, making a pedagogy for those instruments, and connecting children with some of the best musicians in the world, uh, first of all, to be mentored, but also to work on projects together and, and as equals. The, the idea is to put kids with a symphony orchestra to put on a concert which has been rehearsed, partly composed by kids, and uh, to have it be completely natural that the kids and the Berlin Philharmonic, for instance, would be on stage together. So we designed a series of instruments in the middle. Um, well actually, the, the orange one on the side is called a music shaper. Uh, it measures the electricity in your fingers on specially designed conductive thread. So the thread can actually measure the electricity in your finger. So as you touch the thread, the, the, sque the shaper knows where you're touching it. So um, the embroidery is actually a kind of um, a keypad. So depending on how it's embroidered, it leads you to touch it in various ways. So I can touch it and squeeze it. And it's, it's very good for teaching small children how to control subtle aspects of music like dynamics, just or, or timbre, like that. Um, so we have a whole bunch of uh, exercises and pieces written for shapers. Beat bugs are to teach kids about rhythm. Um, they look like little bugs. You, you hit the beat bug, <laughs> captures whatever rhythm you're beating. Um, and then it plays it back, and you bend those two antenna. They're actually bend sensors. When you bend the one on the left, it changes the rhythm. It complexifies the rhythm. So I've, if I've done and then it might snap back when I let it go. And the other one changes the um, sound quality and the pitch. So it might go something like that. And um, so. It's designed for groups of kids to play together. Um, so they're, they're gamed, I don't know if you have hot potato here in the, in the UK, but um, you might make a rhythm, modify it, and then point it at your friend, slap it, and your rhythm jumps to your friend's beat bug, which starts playing and glowing. And your task then might be to imitate exactly what's been played or to vary it and send it on. Um, so it's not only for rhythm, but for listening and for, for group performance. 
Um, so a whole set of instruments like that. And then a set of activities for composing music because um, one of my big interests was uh, there's so many barriers to having people create their own original music. Uh, you, you need to know notation, you need to know music theory, you need to know um, rules of music. Um, but you don't really need to because everybody has ears and can listen. So we made this interface called HyperScore, which allows you to draw with lines and color. Um, I, I can tell you more about it later. I don't have time to go in, into it in detail. But the idea was to have something that would be extremely simple. You actually start by making little fragments. Each fragment gets a color. Then you draw with those fragments and um, layer them. And then a lot of the rules of music are in this software. So um, for instance, the rules of harmony. So I can turn on harmony, and then the blue line in the middle, when I shape that, it fits everything I've written into a harmonic language, and the shape of the line determines the way the chords change, the way the color of the music changes. So very intuitively, I can make very complex pieces, and I can push a button, and it'll write these out as notation for traditional musicians, and uh, orchestras can play pieces uh, written by kids. Um, one of our, some of our best experiences actually were, were with the BBC Scottish Symphony in Glasgow where we were sent into inner city schools uh, with kids who not only didn't have music but didn't, didn't have much uh, creative or stimulating in school and had kids do amazing things that were played by the BBC Scottish broadcast on Radio 3. We started noticing that really, things were really happening to kids. They were becoming motivated, they were becoming interested in school, they were becoming focused, and they were making interesting music. So we started thinking that there must be wider applications for providing creative tools for a whole range of people who are not usually invited to do anything in music. Uh, so we started a few years ago an ongoing project in looking at the implications of music for health. Um, this could be a whole topic on its own, but uh, one of the bits of research that's been coming out over the last five years or so is just how remarkable the connection music is with so many things about our, our mental and physical health. As you probably know, music is almost always the last thing that Alzheimer's patients will still respond to. Almost 100% of the cases, you'll find somebody who can't recognize themselves or anybody in their family. You can almost always find a shard of music that that person will still respond to, often get up out of his or her chair and start singing along. Then when the, and, and then when the music's gone, that goes away as well. So there's a whole series of, of techniques being developed to use that recognition of music in late Alzheimer's as a lifeline for people's personalities and memories. Same thing for restoring movement through Parkinson's or speech uh, through strokes, many, many things. And so we've been exploring this in a variety of ways. Uh, the first thing we did was to take HyperScore, the composing language, and to bring it to a variety of hospitals around Boston uh, to work with people with both physical and uh, mental problems. So this has really caught on. The, the effect of people, you know, people um, all kinds of conditions seem to be improving through this kind of technique. Uh, uh, it's being prescribed in more and more hospitals, and we're doing research to figure out, out why and how to, how to improve it. Adam, in particular, is doing a PhD thesis now. Looks like music might be the best way of early detection for Alzheimer's disease, which, as you know, there really isn't any technique now. So uh, we're, we have funding from the Alzheimer's Association to develop a whole series of listening and reaction tools for an iPhone, actually, uh, f that seem to be uh, predicting Alzheimer's much earlier than anything else does. Um, we decided to combine this sort of activity with the performance type of activity and worked with one of the people we met during these first set of experiments, um, a young man named Dan Elsie, who's 30 years old, has cerebral palsy. Um, before he did the composing activities, Nobody knew he had any interest in music. He has very great difficulty speaking. He can't speak. He speaks through a talking machine. So it's very hard for him to explain himself. Uh, turns out he, you know, he's extremely bright, ex exuberant, dying to express himself. Turns out music is a very good way to, for him to express himself. So he's become, in the last few years, an expert in composing using HyperScore. And we asked him if he wanted to have a system where he could perform his own pieces. So he said yes. So we worked with him over a period of about six months to use a, an IR infrared head tracking device to analyze the way he liked to move, listening to certain kinds of music, then to look at the piece he'd written to make a performance system for him. Of course, uh, with cerebral palsy, he couldn't absolutely, with 100% certainty, predict exactly how he would move in a particular moment. So we had to do a lot of work to separate um, the, the movements he was trying to make from movements maybe he wasn't trying to make, and um, came up with a system where he can perform his own piece by moving his head. So one of the amazing things about this is that um, 
when you see Dan perform, and, and one, of the, the, one of the unpredicted things is that many people want to see him perform, so my students and I spend a certain amount of our time as his roadies going around helping him perform. You never know where these things will lead. But what's amazing is you see Dan on stage, and all of a sudden he's not a guy with cerebral palsy, but you, you, it's Dan. You, you know what he's like, you know what he's trying to tell you, the communication is very direct and immediate, and um, it, it's his way of communicating, and it's, it's very simple. And so he's now using this device to write more pieces and perform, and we're generalizing that kind of technology. Um, what's especially interesting about it is that everything I showed you up until now, even the cello or the guitars, there, there's still instruments that are designed for a certain type of person. If you make a cello for Yo-Yo Ma, even if it has special measurement, anybody who plays the cello can use that cello and make an interpretation and shape the music the way they would want to. What's special about the work with Dan is that the instrument we built was only for him. It, it took, it took uh, analysis and um, um, it, it valued what he could do to express himself and it also was aware of his own limitations, the, the kind of things he couldn't do in a particular context. And it was fine-tuned for just his particular way of expression. And my own sense is that instruments in the future and, and tools that help us express must have this quality. They, they have to be truly personal, they have to be fine-tuned for each of us, because each of us has things that we're very good at, and each of us needs a prosthetic, if you will, to help us with things that we're not so good at. So that's a direction that we're moving in. Um, let me, let me show you another couple of ideas uh, before I stop. So um, I write operas. Um, I like writing operas for a lot of reasons. But one reason is that they're big projects that can be laboratories for trying many things at once. And um, this word opera and personal is kind of an unusual juxtaposition on purpose. Um, opera is usually uh, spectacle and, and um, involving but maybe distancing. But, Opera can also be a very, very personal way of understanding characters or of expressing oneself. So uh, the project, one project we're working on right now um, is, a is called Death and the Powers. Um, and it's, it's an opera about a man in his late 60s who's rich, successful, um, powerful, a little bit crazy, kind of like Walt Disney meets Howard Hughes meets um, Bill Gates or somebody like that. And uh, he's obsessed not so much with living forever, but he wants everything about himself to stay in the world after he dies. And he wants to be able to influence the world even when he's not there. So he invents something called a system. And uh, basically, he finds a way to download everything about himself into his environment. And literally what happens is that the main character, famous singer named Jim Ma James Madalena, um, is there at the beginning of the opera about to turn his system on. Then the system goes on. He says, see you later. The performer disappears. And the stage becomes the performer. So the stage is actually the main character. It's a big robotic stage, um, which is made up of uh, these large movable walls. The walls move and vibrate and, and change image. Um, our designer is Alex McDowell, who um, is a member of the RSA. He's a, uh, one of the top Hollywood designers. And um, it looks kind of like this. And these walls become the character. Even though he's not on stage, you, you know that it's him, or you're supposed to know that it's him. This brings up an interesting case. A lot of the instruments that we've built have tended to dramatize the relationship. If, if Yo-Yo Ma's there with a cello, one of the interesting things is, how is he as a human being shaping this technology, interacting with the technology? Um, and you want to understand that. With this performance, the performer's not there, uh, but you must sense that he is there in these walls. You must know that he's off stage somewhere. You must feel it in this abstracted form. Um, so that's a big challenge that we're working on. Uh, one thing we're doing is um, measuring breathing and, and um, sweat and heartbeat of a performer to change the whole environment. So this is one of my students working on that right now. Um, there are a whole series of robots on stage that make up a kind of Greek chorus in the opera. Um, this is the one on the right, uh, has uh, just been finished about a week ago. Um, there's a gigantic chandelier that looks like a lighting chandelier, but is actually a big robotic string instrument with about 200 strings. Each string is um, played by a little robotic fingers or by sending in electronic vibrations. Um, that looks like this. And I think I'm running a little late, so I'm not going to show you the video on Death and the Power. You'll have to come see it. Um, that opens in uh, Monaco in uh, next September, so you have a little bit of time. Um, but, and, and I maybe won't tell you about that now either, but I will tell you 
um, about the project that's about to open in two weeks because it's in the UK and that one you really could come to. So, and, and, and this one's interesting because it's a project that really allows us to look at how to bring together um, a much wider group of people um, participating in a musical experience than is normally possible. So um, the project is called Skellig. As Ralph said, uh, it's an opera based on a best-selling book by David Almond. Um, it, it, there was a, a play based on this book playing in London, I think, just last week. So the, the book's been out for about 10 years. Exactly 10 years, actually. And um, for the 10th anniversary, the Sage Gate said, commissioned us to make an opera. So the first thing about this was uh, to make a project based on a book that many, many people knew to turn it into another former. So the fact that many people know Skellig means that there's an intrinsic interest in this, in this project. Uh, it's a fantastic book. David Almond's there, second from the right. Um, we picked, or partly we picked and, and the presenter picked us. Um, the Sage Gateshead in uh, Newcastle is a very unusual organization. Um, it's not an opera house, it's a music center devoted really to thinking about a new definition about uh, what music is, uh, the different kinds of music that might be presented. Um, it's a glorious building, if you haven't seen it, designed by Norman Foster. It has one of the best concert halls I've ever seen, which is the only hall I know that balances acoustic music and electric music extremely well. Uh, it's a fantastic place. Um, uh, they, we have these uh, angel wings all over uh, Newcastle now to advertise the piece. Um, it's, it's a place that mixes up values about what music's for in a way that, um, that I believe in very deeply. So um, it has a whole center in, in the Sage Gateshead building that's designed for people to do things like hyperscore, to touch music, to try music on their own. Um, it has a full program for young people, both pre-professional, people who are going to be professional musicians, but also young people who just want to enjoy themselves with music. Um, this is all in the context of uh, you know, very high-level concerts going on all the time. Um, and it also has one of the larger programs for seniors that I know anywhere. So uh, it has um, hundreds and hundreds of people over 50, 55 coming in each weekend to participate in choruses and performances. And it's all mixed up. One of the great things about the Sage is that although the building was designed by Norman Foster, all of the um, curators and producers there uh, have been producing uh, grassroots events uh, in Newcastle for years, so it's, it has, it's, it's, it's real. Um, we mixed it up in the production as well, so um, we have a group of teenagers everywhere the project goes, um, non-professional teenagers who really want to perform, um, combined with some of the world's greatest performers on stage, uh, making this production together, so um, a, a real mix of, of backgrounds. Um, the public gets to follow along the project. It's connected with the Sing Up project, which you probably know is a UK initiative to get as many people, especially in K to 12 school, to, to sing. So people can work with our Hyperscore software, write pieces and, and sing based on Skellig. Um, and there's a symposium on the 29th of, um, of November uh, to have people, especially people involved in presenting new work, to look at combining uh, audience and professionals in a new way, uh, presenting work based on novels. Um, and just to close, um, what ties all this work together is the fact that um, the different participants in making music, uh, um, consuming music, uh, um, marketing music, I think need to be in a relationship that's much different than the one that exists now. Uh, there, there are many models of how that might happen, but it's not obvious that it will happen, so part of our job is to find uh, structures that can help it to happen. Um, I think of the way music should be in the future more like the way cuisine is now. Um, cuisine, food, is one of the most healthy things in our culture, where we all go out to three-star restaurants for a special evening. Um, we cook ourselves on a, you know, for having family and friends over on a Saturday night once in a while. At the same time, we slap food together for our kids running out the door in the morning. Um, we have no problem going back and forth between experiencing the best of cuisine, making food ourselves, following recipes, inventing it ourselves. It's absolutely natural. And in music, we don't do that, or in most of the arts, we don't do that. The more that we can uh, arrive at a situation like that, the, be the better it is. And this means that individual artists, the music business itself, companies and organizations involved in technology, lifestyle, health and social organizations, presenting and broadcasting entities, research institutions who really are thinking of new ideas, artists who can not only make their art but work to help the general public improve the level of what they're doing, 
um, and the public itself, from amateurs all the way up and from all generations. We have to find a way to knit all of these uh, entities together in a much more coherent way uh, to move forward. Um, so amateurs and experts, young and old, healthy, not so healthy, commercial and idealistic, and music that's very familiar with the craziest stuff we can imagine. And if we do something like that, um, oh, and actually we're just opening a new uh, center for creativity and invention at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, it opens next fall uh, to be a kind of center to pull these entities together. It's a new beautiful Fumihiko Maki building, which is about to be opened. Um, and I think not only with these entities together, but working together, uh, the kind of people who are in this room right now, I really think could be one of the great periods of music. Um, but it won't happen alone. We have to make it happen. Thanks very much.